Like the Armenians, Ethiopians cultivate legends about the two kings of old who possessed magical powers, Solomon and Alexander. Ethiopian magical texts include talismans against God and God, next one, please, whom Alexander is said to have confined behind bronze walls at the end of the earth. The gates are guarded by automatons. This is the subject of one of the most popular stories of the Armenian Middle Ages, the Batman II and Bobin the story of the Bronze City. The Prayer of Solomon's Net, next one, please, describes how the ancient monarch was trapped by blacksmiths but vanquished them by invoking God's name. And here one can discuss, probably at, at some length, why blacksmiths, because in Armenia, blacksmiths also have magical powers to confine various powerful beings. Um, Ethiopians also believe that Solomon drew portraits of demons in a book. Demons are curious to see themselves, but when they see Solomon's pictures, they also vanish in a puff of smoke. The book, which is a pseudepigraphin, of of course, Solomon never wrote such a book, though one wishes he had, exists in Armenia. And the manuscript was published by the French Armenologist, Armenologist Frédéric Macri. Next picture. That's an example. So here is the demon, Le Soisantien, no less. There are quite a few. And here is the text about it. Solomon questioning it, asking what it does, the demon reciting what it does, and then the spell against it consisting of nonsense words, usually made up of a mixture of Armenian and Arabic, and then glossolalia. Glossolalia, just pleasantly sounding, very vocalic syllables. And these are typical. We'll come back to the whole question of glossolalia in a moment. So. The magical scrolls and other texts and paintings of Christian Ethiopia are so very close in subject and style to those of Armenia that they may fairly be said to belong to a single common East Christian tradition of folk religion. So although the social and historical context of the East African Deptera must be in many respects radically different from that of the Giratsu in the Ottoman Empire or the Transcaucasus, it would not be unreasonable to infer some similarities between the two classes of magician artists. These might include a powerful, even traumatic, initiatory dream or other vision, followed by apprenticeship and the production and graduation of one's own magical notebook, the experience of possession by a spirit or saint, ancillary mastery of healing arts, and the production of scrolls and other talismans to order for afflicted clients, an uneasy symbiosis with the established church, and a position in the community of mixed reverence and fear. In both nations, a sanctioned niche is thus found for individuals who might be stigmatized as marginal or abnormal elsewhere, a feature of traditional societies innocent of the blessings or curses of psychiatry and its attendant worldview. Let us finally consider the outsider artist in Western society and his affinity to these Eastern Orthodox magician artists. The definition of the outsider artist has to be fairly broad and to involve social polarities. At one extreme are the people who are criminals by any definition, such as murderers and child molesters, or who are unable to function at all in everyday life, such as schizophrenics or other delusional types, and these create art in prison or mental asylums. An example is Adolf Wilflieger, the next picture, uh, who died in 1930, a Swiss mental patient and child molester whose intricate paintings teem with winged beings, angelic and demonic crosses, multiplies geometric patterns, and dense streams of text everywhere. Wolfley's paintings, which are strikingly similar to the Ethiopian religious ones, reflect a complex private cosmology, peopled by saints with invented names in which the artist himself is a heroic and persecuted figure. The eerie trinities of another artist and outsider, Johann Knüpfer, remind one of the three saints who pursue Lilith, 
but in his work, they are themselves pursued by an evil hunter. So his saints, um, with, the, with the dog, so, so his saints, you see, have an aspect that poor Lilith didn't. I don't think God's minions had firearms in those days. Next one. And here are saint-like beings by themselves, rather like our Simui Sasimui and Simon Wu, whom you remember from a while ago. In the opinion of a recent scholar, outsider artist, jeweled, and he says, by passion, troubled psychology, extreme ideology, faith, despair, the desperate need to be uh, heard and seen that comes with cultural mar marginalization and mental unease. Outsider artists need not be in maids of asylums, though. And at the other end of the continuum, we find outsider artists who could be moderately well-adjusted housewives, businessmen, and the like. But often they are disenfranchised people who wake up one day and in an act of heroic resistance to their social dysfunctionality, throw themselves into a great task of creating a body of artistic work. Now such artistic release, and here is its kinship to the Armenian material, most often has some kind of magical and religious aspect and is the expression of a supernatural vision. The vision can be highly structured, and its artistic and verbal expression extremely sophisticated while remaining idiosyncratic. Uh, one might induce as an example of this the English poet and artist William Blake in the late 19th, 18th century, uh, who was himself um, a member of various heretical movements at, at odds with the Church of England, and who invented his own artistic techniques, even though he had been trained in the conventional ones. Or the religious <coughs> vision can be at the fringe of mainstream religion and beyond. And part of the reason for this, one would suggest, is that just as Western society tends to marginalize the religious visionary, the mainstream Western art world, for the most part, correspondingly marginalizes the expression of sincere religious experience if it's unmediated by a kind of sarcastic irony. So an artist who is not yet an outsider runs the risk of finding himself one if his art is unabashedly religious in content and sentiment. It was indeed an innovative artist, impatient with the establishment, Jean Dubuffet, who coined the term Art Roo, of which we have outsider art as an English equivalent, collecting this kind of painting and eventually establishing a museum for it in Lausanne, thus making it a subject for study by art historians as well as psychiatrists and criminologists. And here are some of the experiences of relevance of some other outsider artists. August Netter, born 1868, beheld a vision of, in the sky of a screen across which a torrent of images passed. God, the witch who created the world, wars, monuments, castles, in all some 10,000 objects in the course of a hallucination that lasted half an hour, which he took the rest of his life to set down in detailed drawings. In Netter's vision, the world is the creation of an evil being, you notice, rather than of the good God, who seems to hover somewhere behind the wings of the universe. Thus, his cosmology is substantially the same as the vision described in a hermetic text, the Poimandris, the famous uh, commander of the European Middle Ages, and it's even closer to the ideas propounded by a similar visionary in the third century, after a series of visions and visitations by a spirit twin. This was Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, a world religion of late antiquity, and Mani was also, and this is well known to Persians still, but less well known to the Westy, the author of a vast painting called the Ardeca, or the Arshani version that he executed himself. 